cause I know you Is it late enough for you to come and stay over Cause we're free to love, so tease me mm -hmm. I made no promises, I can't do golden rings, but I'll give you everything Please welcome Vice President EMEA, Oracle NetSuite, Nikki Tozer. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Women's Leadership General Session this afternoon. My name is Nikki Tozer, I'm the Vice President of Europe, Middle East and Africa for Oracle NetSuite. The more astute amongst you will recognise that perhaps I'm not American, I am actually British. Um, and you may also know that the British are not very well known for expressing any kind of emotion. And we're very well known for having a stiff upper lip all of the time. So you're going to have to trust me when I say I'm really excited to introduce this session for you this afternoon. <laughs> and I'm also... <laughs> I'm also really excited to uh, be in the room with so many esteemed women both on and off the stage this afternoon. So the objective today really is to explore a little bit about how we can uh, better develop women getting involved in all aspects of business strategy and execution, give you some ideas how you can take that back into your organisations and maybe um, you know, improve your careers along, along the way with that. So, it only seems fair I should tell you a little bit about my career and my progression and to what I might attribute some of those successes that I've had along the way. So buckle up, it's going to be a long story. Uh, it's not really, I have 10 minutes. So, um, so I, I graduated from uh, University of Kiel in the north of England, which was a challenge in itself. Uh, management science with French and German. And when I finished that, I was actually, took a telemarketing job in a software company, um, uh, sorry, a receptionist job in a telemarketing company while I applied for lots of graduate programs that I thought I wanted to do. And at that time, I was invited to join their telemarketing team, which I guess these days we call a business development team or, or business development representatives. Um, and I was invited to then go and set up the business development team for a company called Arbor Software, which actually then got later acquired by Hyperion and later acquired by Oracle, and now is part of the, uh, the portfolio of NetSuite, so a, a long full circle there. Um, but actually the biggest leap that I had to make and the one that I had the most resistance to was going from that telesales role or inside sales role into a field sales role. And I was told at the time, you're too young, and you don't have enough sales experience. It was quite a male-dominated environment, and maybe on reflection, that might have had something to do with it. But usually, if somebody tells me no, it's a bit red rag to a bull. So I spent quite a lot of time persuading people, convincing them, proving myself, and I managed to get a chance to go into the field sales role. And then I sold Hyperion from 2000, and 2000 to 2012, and in 2007, we got acquired into Oracle, so um, both in the Hyperion team and the Oracle team. And, or and Oracle at that time is a very male-dominated environment, and so you really had to learn how to ad adjust to that and not just help everybody that asked you for help because you were a woman and that's what women do. Um, in 2016, Oracle bought me back for $9.3 billion. I'm not that arrogant, really. Um, and uh, as part of that acquisition and the investment that they made, they asked us to build the EMEA organization from one country, just in the UK, to 15 countries across EMEA. And as part of that, I was promoted to be the VP, uh, the sales director for Northern Europe for the channel and the direct business. And when our VP, uh, EMEA, moved on, I, I stepped into his role to, to run the EMEA business. So really, when I look at my success in that, in that process, I really put it down to good preparation, hard work and determination, and an absolute laser focus on 
what you have to deliver to move your business forward. It's really easy. We all get distracted with a myriad of things every day. But what's important today might not be important tomorrow. And Jason was talking about earlier on, keep the main thing the main thing. And my dad sometimes reminds me that I demonstrated this trait very early in my life when uh, at my brother's primary school sports day, I won the preschool race. He was very quick to remind me it wasn't because I was the fastest runner, um, but it was because I was the only kid on the start line actually prepared and focused on the finishing line. And I think that's something that's really stood me very well in, uh, in my career. Um, but interestingly, I also never really considered myself to be a woman in a male-dominated environment. I just decided to get on with the job in hand, to be better than the person next to me, to be more competitive, to be more driven, to work harder and to be more determined, whatever their gender. Uh, or diversity even. And that's not to underplay the gender gap that exists. It does exist, some industries are harder to crack than others. But for me personally, it was always much easier to focus on what I could change, what could drive me forward, rather than focusing what might hold me back. And if we think about what our world would look like today if people like Emmeline Pankhurst and Maya Angelou had, had focused on what would be too hard, you know, we would be in a very different spot today. But of course, we can't do that at the expense of the rest of our teams. So every single individual in your teams plays an absolute crucial role. And it's never a great idea to tread all over everybody else. And good leaders will really allow them to continue to do their role. And that's the mark of any good leader, really, regardless of, of your gender. Um, so I have been very lucky in my career to work with and to know many, many ambitious women and I think, you know, sometimes being a woman in a man's world can be a bit of an advantage because I was selling software for a lot of my career. And if I was a woman selling software and there was nine other male reps, the stakeholder I was selling to was going to remember me. I also feel quite often they would be more prepared to open up to a woman about what they don't understand or what were they anxious about of a night? What was keeping them up in their business at night? Which made me more able to focus my proposals and the business value that I was going to provide to them. So sometimes it's an advantage. But I also found that women are very good at talking to each other outside of the workplace. I think sometimes in the workplace, there is maybe a reluctance to say, actually, I'm not really quite sure about this. And these relationships that I've had with these ambitious women has really given me an opportunity to say, look, you know, actually, I, I'm not sure if I'm on the right track here. Can we just have a conversation about it? And, you know, that's actually, I think, is a really powerful confidence to have because best ideas come out of considering all of the different options. So I love to see that in these kind of groups. And really, that's why these kind of tracks that we have are so important because that enables you to have those conversations and to learn from your peer groups and to just think about different experiences that you might have had. So in when I was when I first joined NetSuite, we had we developed a women in NetSuite group. And really that was designed for the young women who are going into their first careers, perhaps from university, to really help them to understand that they can be confident, they can be powerful, they can learn from their peer groups. And one of the things I found most interesting about that was how inspired they were to see a woman in a senior leadership role. It really gave them the confidence that actually everything that they were doing today really could give them that opportunity to be in, the, in that role. So that was a really important part of women in NetSuite. Of course, now we have Oracle Women's Leadership and they have a myriad of programs with WebExes and networking and conferences to help women to develop and get that right support. We also have women in finance events where some of our sales leaders and sales reps go out into the prospects and customers in the community to help inspire their lead leadership. Last year, we had a uh, women's leadership lunch here. And really, all of those activities have culminated in this women in leadership track. 
Um, and they are, you know, now we have over 400 registrants for it. We have five breakout sessions, um, and they include things like diversity, they include things like female investment, and one I think is really important is about um, negotiation, because there's lots of research that says, you know, how to ask for what you want. There's lots of research that says actually one of the biggest things that holds women back is that they're not so prepared to ask for what they want as perhaps a man is in, in, a, in, in business. So um, those are really good sessions. If you can get yourself to those, um, would be a, be a great advantage for you. So you're going to hear from lots of inspirational women today on the stage. Um, and now I'm going to introduce you to one of them. Um, she has a long list of credentials, so uh, <laughs> I um, may read some of them. But um, she is a serial entrepreneur. She is a thought leader and a board advisor. She is a New York Times best-selling author, four highly acclaimed books, including um, The Secrets of Sin Silicon Valley and What Everyone Else Can Learn from the Innovation Capital of the World. After selling her first company, she created Alley to the Valley, proverbial uh, female golf course where highly accomplished women can come together to create deals. Prior to her move to Silicon Valley, <laughs> In 2006, she spent 18 years in Washington, D.C. as a staffer in the U.S. Congress and the White House, as well as serving on-air political commentator on CNN, MSNBC and Fox News. I am actually quite humbled to welcome to the stage Deborah Perry Pashoni. Deborah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, Nikki, you may be British with the stick upper lip <laughs> and also not express emotion, but you always, Brits, sound so much more intelligent than the rest of us. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome. We're going to kick some butt over the next hour and a half, right? Awesome. Fantastic. So I was getting ready to come here, and after 18 years of togetherness, my husband actually took note of what I was wearing. He goes, huh interesting outfit. And when you get a huh from a guy who's an executive at Nordstrom, it kind of means something. And I said I wanted to remain brand consistent in my message today, that the, the blueness was about the blue sky of opportunity for women in leadership, but it was going to take fiery red kick butt shoes to get us over that hurdle over the tipping point. So with that said, I wanted to share a little bit about my background as well, uh, because why I got so interested in women uh, was based on my background. So I did spend 18 years working in Washington, D.C., working on Capitol Hill, then the White House, and then I fell into media. And I like to think of my 18 years in where things happen in twos. So I said uh, that I really learned how to do two things very well in the world of national politics and national media. And the first thing was I learned how to divide people into an us versus them. Because in Washington, if you're in the political realm, everything was you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're for the bill, you're against the bill, you're a friend, a foe, all of the above. But I'm sure today it's a much friendlier place than when I left it. <laughs> um, but I got very good at that. And the other thing I learned how to do was put fear in people. Because if you're running for office and you want to galvanize and make your bank account deeper, you just put fear in people. And clearly, if you're CNN and you want to get more viewers, you, you just put fear out there. It's, it's a real way to galvanize and mobilize people to do something. But then I also thought, Gosh, in my 18 years, generally I was asked two questions. One was, where did you go to school? As if that would determine the value of who I was. And in my case, we couldn't afford for me to go to the school that I wanted to and the schools that I got into because I ended up paying for my undergrad and my graduate education as well. And then the second question we got asked was, who do you work for? Again, as if that determined my value. But one day, my husband came home in 2006, and he said, we're moving to Silicon Valley. 
And so I didn't even know where Silicon Valley was. I knew San Francisco and LA, and I had to look on a map, and I was trying to figure out the physical place of Silicon Valley, only to find out it isn't a physical place. Um, but we ended up moving, and I had to very quickly figure out how I was going to make a living, because again, we were living pay to paycheck to paycheck at that point. And so my third week in, I'm standing in line at our local Starbucks, and I'm having a conversation with the woman in front of me, and she recognized that I was new in town. And she said to me, how can I help you? And from that very conversation, she had arranged for me to meet a venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins, which I did three weeks later. And from that conversation, I ended up raising $5 million from an investor. And all of a sudden, all these women were coming along to offer unsolicited advice. In fact, one of them was very early on at Oracle, Karen White. But little by little, these women adopted me to share their knowledge, to share information. And one of them said to me, you need to engage an investment banker. I didn't know what an investment banker did. I much didn't know what the term venture capital was before I moved to Silicon Valley. But nonetheless, we did. We engaged an investment banker early on. And because of that individual, the company sold. And I thought to myself, had I still been on the East Coast in Washington, in this world of national politics and media, I'm not sure this would have happened. And so I was fascinated by this new breed of women that were in Silicon Valley. So one day, um, I decided I was gonna write a book proposal, because I'd written one book at that point, and I titled this book proposal, Silicon Valley Women Drive Porsches, because they were in the driver's seat. It was about having the hubris, and really just the inspiration to kind of take charge, be transactional, and really work together to collaborate in a way that pushed all of these women collectively forward. But my editor thought, okay, maybe that's a secondary book. Let's write about the ecosystem. Let's write about the culture. And it very much got me into this mindset of how did we get from here to there? And the same thing, how did Silicon Valley evolve into this unique anomaly that it is? So I went on book tour for a long time with this book, and I really got in front of lots of different people but I also got in front of a lot of women's groups and really started to think about some of the challenges but opportunities that women face. And so, oddly enough, back in 2010, I got a phone call from a woman by the name of Janet Hansen, who was an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, and she also led their women's leadership program, and she said, what do you have going on with those women in Silicon Valley? They've got hubris, they get deals done, they're transactional, they're very comfortable just doing the art of the deal. I wish we could teach our women on the East Coast. And I said to her, Janet, let's do something about it. Let's take 25 women from the East Coast, 25 women from the West Coast and Silicon Valley, let's throw them in the ballroom together and see what happens. We had no deal-making methodology. We obsessed about the content um, to the point Janet said to me, Deborah, don't underestimate the power of these accomplished women being in the room together. So Sheryl Sandberg found out, if, and she asked if she could speak at it, and I said, sure. And then the New York Times found out about it and said, can we cover it? And so, had it not been for that New York Times reporter who was commissioned to do a second story, I would have never known all of the outcomes that came from these women just being in the room together. So all sorts of things happened. We had venture capitalists there, we had corporate executives there, we had female lawyers, we had one litter agent in the room, and out of that resulted the sourcing of deals. There was one deal flow that happened the New York Times reporter even got a book deal out of just being on that room. The book ended up being Stiletto Network, if anybody's familiar with that book. 
And so as you can appreciate, once the story hit the New York Times, I was bombarded with women contacting me from all over the country saying, when are you bringing it to Seattle? What about Miami? What about Atlanta? So we had no choice to build this out and figure out what it was. So we realized that the greatest opportunity was focusing on the transaction, the ask and the offer. What is it that you need that's gonna help you get to that next level? And so we found, doing this around the country and in London as well, that really so much of it was based on the need for capital. Uh, lots of women were seeking corporate board seats. Lots of women wanted to do client and business development. So if you're in sales, this is a great opportunity. Come with your list and to share what it is that you need. And then a fourth category for us became about platform building. So there were women who were interested in book deals and getting on the speaking circuit and getting into media. And we really felt until those stories were out there and we had more women in mass, that we were gonna continue to read about the successes of men. And it wasn't gonna give us the aspiration that we needed. We needed to see ourselves in that. But still, Alley to the Valley was very much a part-time project for me, very many years. We hired a staff, put it together, did it all over the country. I focused on my day job. And then Me Too happened. And my 13-year-old son came home one day and he said, Mom, what is Allie to the Valley's role in Me Too? And I said, well, no, th nothing really. I mean, we don't get involved in workplace issues. This was just really fast-tracking business opportunities. And then my son turned to me and he goes, gosh, it seems like you should be doing something more based on the Me Too movement. Well, we didn't necessarily take that position, but what we wanted to do was go back and figure out where our women are at. Because I knew, based on the statistics that were constantly getting thrown out there, a lot of government statistics, a lot of wage information, but actually the picture was far brighter than, than what we were reading about. So again, I wanted to figure out where we started, where are we at, and what's going to get us over that mountaintop. And so I took a step back, put my research hat on, talked to my editor, and said, I think there's a book here. Let's kind of figure this out. And so when we think about it, there's thousands of years of religious and cultural doctrines that made the world about men. So men are the ones that work was created for. But then you come to the realize that who wrote those doctrines? Men. So men were very much in the position of being The one thing as the care, or women were the caretakers and men were the providers. So it very much put us in a defensive position. So we took a step back even further and said, but what is that one characteristic? What is that one thing that is truly making a difference that has sealed the deal for men in work? And this is what we determined the action of competition. So we thought about it and we said, okay, what about boys to men? How much of competition, what percentage do you think is wrapped up in their identity? And you can throw out a number if anybody thinks about it. We wanted to look at boys to men and how they did competition. So we thought somewhere between 50 and maybe 100% boys were wrapped up in competition in their characteristics of their identity. And then we said, okay, what's the question around girls? What percentage do girls feel are wrapped up in competition? And we said maybe somewhere between 25 and 50%. But here's the difference. What competition 
are boys and men engaged in? What do they learn early on? Anybody want to throw out an answer? Sports, exactly. Now, the same question for girls. What type of competition do girls engage in? Girls, friends, boys at some point, clothing, absolutely. Now, which style of competition is rewarded at work? Sports, exactly. So this, we determined, was the, really the one factor that made such an enormous difference between men's success at work and women's success. But yet, as women entered the workforce in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and of course lots of women have been engaged in the workforce early on, but in the professional workforce, women had had to put up with decades of a lot of crap and still being in that caretaker role. But yet it built grit. Because the very women that we had at Alley the Valley in 2010 took charge and decided that things are going to be different. And I'll share a little bit about their story in a moment. But here's what we started to happen since the Me Too movement. There was this cultural combustion of economic gains for a lot of women, which I'll talk about in a moment. There was social development, like these movements of Me Too, and yes, there was an initial backlash, but we're starting to see people galvanize in different ways outside of fear. And then simultaneously, there were government mandates happening. So the great state of California said, look, if you're gonna do business in this state, you need to have women on corporate boards. And now New Jersey and Massachusetts followed suit. And I think that's phenomenal. So all of this was kind of coalescing and coming together. It was the perfect storm. Also, what was happening was not only were women trying to get a larger piece of the pie, but now they were making their own pie as well. And what I mean by that, those women who came to Alley to the Valley who were knocking their heads up against the ceilings or the walls at their venture capital firm said, enough, I'm just going to build out my own venture capital fund. And so we've seen this enormous uptick in women starting their own funds and their angel funds and, and building businesses from home. And now, in this era that we're living in, you can make slime at home, have a YouTube channel, and make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, which there is a woman, her name is escaping me at the moment, very successful, down in LA, 25 years old, living in this big mansion, and she has this very successful YouTube channel around slime. But what we knew is that this was not being reflected in the statistics that we were being shown. All of the statistics were really about the lack of women in leadership, the lack of women in the C-suite, the lack of women on corporate boards, but yet there were really important gains that weren't being accounted for. And so we realized that how we define power and success has completely spun on its head. And that's a good thing because right now we are seeing a tremendous amount of democratization of opportunity. So when I started on Capitol Hill, you had to go to an Ivy League school, which I didn't, to be able to get ahead. You had to come from the right family. There were lots of Kennedys floating around working on Capitol Hill. And this is not the case anymore. Some of the most powerful women and wealthiest women are not going to school, and I'm talking about Kylie Jenner and Cardi B, and are having such potent messages out there, right, wrong, good, bad, or indifferent. But now you've got members of Congress who are now focusing on what some of these women are saying because they have become unbelievably influential and therefore the power has shifted. So it's a really exciting time. 
so we do look at both sides of the ledger. We look at the corporate element and those women who decide that they want to do entrepreneurship, how they want to define it on their terms and when they want to get involved as well. And so we still realized running Alley to the Valley that there was an elephant in the room. We just couldn't figure out, before we did this research on competition, why it is that women can't better support each other. Why can there only be one woman at the table? Why can't we be friends and ask each other for business? And so we needed to dig deeper at Alley to the Valley and realize that you could be very, very artful in the transaction and you can learn how to develop a friendship from there as well. And so that's what we want to get in our messaging out. Because really what I'm gonna give you right now are four characteristics, four areas that you can make such a difference if you just adopt these four things. So this is four characteristics that play well on the golf course. And sadly, I don't play golf, I'm a, a marathon runner, so I didn't even realize that women don't play at the same level that the men did, but it was very much based on the proverbial female golf course, where the deals get made. So here's the first thing that you can do. You just shift your mindset. It is so critical to take ourselves out of the defensive position and be a part of the offensive, that we're in control. Because those negative statistics that are out there, the negative conversation, the short-term backlash on Me Too, it only pushes us down further. It doesn't help empower us. And we have to learn how to trust until we have a reason not to trust. And for some reason, women kind of start from a place of distrust with each other, but it's a very simple shift. It's a very simple mindset shift that's doable. The second thing that you can learn how to do very well is be transactional. We have watched some of the most successful women come to the Ally to the Valley, and when they present their ask, we don't even know what they're asking for. So asking is something that is incredibly important and something you should be mindful of every single day. And a venture capitalist came by the name of Heidi Roizen, and she got up and publicly said, no one ever wakes up and thinks about, what can I do for Heidi Roizen today? And so it is incumbent upon us to advocate for ourselves. But to not only ask, but to offer. So at Alley to the Valley, we like to say for every ask you present, you should offer three times. Because it's not just about taking, we've got to be able to give. And then you want to get to a place of yes. I have to say this is one of my superpowers. <laughs> when I get a no, I just think, okay, it's the wrong time, it's the wrong person, I've gotta repackage my pitch. But often we have found women at Ally to the Valley just give up when they get that first no. And so if you truly, truly believe in something and you truly, truly want to attain and you believe that you are the best person for the job or for the business or whatever it is, keep at it. You just often have to retweak things. It's very simple that it comes down to that. The third thing is you've got to think about yourself as an entrepreneur. And that is incorporates having a growth mindset. Oftentimes we've found people come to Alley to the Valley and, and depending on where we are in the country, they have all the answers and, and don't really need to think about the vernacular of another industry, but that's part of our secret sauce is that we cross-pollinate industry so that women have the opportunity to learn beyond what they're doing day to day and we cross-pollinate uh, geography as well 
so that you have a national network to turn to. Being part of being entrepreneurial is that you've got to lead with your competitive value. Your competitive value is what is going to sell you in the realm rather than starting with your resume. And really, really critical is to take risks. It's so important to keep moving forward because when you stay still and you stagnate, you don't get anywhere. You don't move. So you almost rather take that risk to potentially move forward rather than to stand still. And then a really critical piece of advice that I got very early on was to adopt the mantra, business is just business. There's nothing emotional about it. And we surveyed the community recently. We said, what, if, what do you think you would like to be better at? And what are your gripes with women? What are your gripes with men? And many people came back and said, I wish I could just jettison the emotion and realize that business is just trying to place everybody in a win-win situation. And when you shift in that mindset, it helps. It helps in the way that business does get done. And then that fourth piece, which I think is so critical, is you've got to build the female golf course. Whether it's alley to the valley, whether it's within your own organization, they just came out with really interesting research. It was Northwestern, um, and I forget who else was involved, but it said women who had female-centered networks are 2.5 times more successful than women who just had male networks. And that was fascinating because it does prove to be in the power of company of like-minded women who can really impact the success of where you want to get to. So those are four characteristics that if you just adopt them will make such enormous impact in your ability to be successful overall. And so the final piece that I want to talk about here is that it just takes one, one person to start, one person to do things differently. As I shared, I travel a lot around the world and I'm constantly hearing the lack of trust that people feel, not just about women in general, but just doing business. And it just takes one person who decides they're gonna go for something that breaks the glass ceiling. They're gonna go try to beat a sales record. They're going to go after a new client that seemed unattainable. It just takes that one person to give you inspiration and to allow that path to be moved forward for other women along the way. So on that note, I thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. So quite a journey and uh, no such thing as coincidence, I think. That's correct, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes still. So um, how do you think women can effectively build net suites in this landscape um, f uh, without the formal groups like Ali to the Valley or the, the, net, uh, the net suite and Oracle Women's Leaderships that we've talked about? That's a great question. Yeah, I had a meeting recently at a, a large tech firm and I sat down with two women and their leadership and they said to me, we don't even know how to navigate our careers within this company. And so what they ended up doing was putting together just an ad hoc group of five women, and they meet every month. And by the way, one of them is employee number 150 out of 350,000 employees around wow. the world. So I'm thinking if she doesn't know what to do, yeah. that really says something for the lack of support and information. Um, but it is a matter of just finding like-minded people where you can sit down together on a regular basis to share information, hear about job opportunities, collect information on potential client and business development. 
So it really, Ally to the Valley very much is an outside organization that anybody can be a part of, but the same kind of attributes to it can be brought in-house at any organization. And in a it's very informal way in some respects. Yep, absolutely. Right. Okay, Deborah, very much. Yes, thank you thank very you much. Cool. It's great thank talk. you thank very you. much. Okay, so uh, really interesting discussion there from Deborah. Um, and now we're going to bring to the stage um, four other women who are going to have a panel discussion. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Mamie Sun, Suzanne Cornkull, Vanessa Ogle, and Jenny Ayotte. Well, hello, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited to continue the conversation around women in leadership, which is something that I'm particularly very passionate about. So I'm Jenny Ayotte. I'm with the Oracle NetSuite team. I run our North America business development program. And Deborah talked about having a seat at the table, which is one of the really big principles that I believe in. And some of you in the audience likely know this, but moderating a panel has been on my leadership bucket list for a very long time. So I'm very humbled to have all of you as part of my, my panel. Um, so thank you, Mamie, Suzanne, and Vanessa for being here. It's, it's great to have you on board. So let's, let's dive in. I would love to start out and have all of you tell us a little bit about your current role within the organization and how you got there. So maybe if we want to start with you and go down the line. Yeah, it's great to be here. So humbled to share the stage with such wonderful women. Uh, my background's a little bit varied. Um, I actually studied uh, human biology in college with a concentration in astrobiology. I thought I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and then I learned about some of the other difficulties of becoming an astronaut. And after a summer internship at NASA, I was like, you know, maybe I'll try something else, like law school. Um, and so um, <laughs> I decided it would be really diverse of me to you know, take time off from Stanford to work somewhere really far away before law school. Um, so I went to Google, uh, it was, you know, down the street, <laughs> and uh, I um, worked in their online sales and operations department, specifically on, in uh, online advertising. Uh, very eye-opening time to be at Google. Um, and I ended up going to law school, and I wanted to focus on U.S.-China relations. So after law school, I moved to Hong Kong. I worked in a corporate law firm. I was actually in a British law firm uh, practicing U.S. law in their Hong Kong group uh, doing, like, U.S. IPOs. So I really don't know what I was doing, actually. Um, <laughs> it was fascinating because um, this was right after the economy crashed in the U.S., and so it was starting to trickle into Asia, but a uh, really interesting time to be in Asia and see how business is done in that part of the world. Um, I ended up deciding that the law firm life and being a corporate lawyer was not the right time, uh, not the right role for me. So I quit my job and I decided I was moving back to California. And I had a friend, a really good friend, um, who was female, who was getting recruited to work for, uh, for Oracle and for Larry. And she was like, hey, you know, I'm not really interested in this job right now, but I know you're looking to figure out what you're doing next in life. Are you interested in this job? You know, I knew a little bit about Oracle. My mom was almost an Oracle DBA. And um, I did a little bit of research online, and uh, I basically found out that the internet thinks that Larry's crazy. Uh, and so I was like, well, this seems like the perfect role for me. No, um, I actually ended up interviewing him and being like, this is fascinating. This guy's really interesting. I could learn a lot from him. So um, I have been at Oracle for seven years now. Um, the chief of staff role is one that I think is growing in the corporate world, mm -hmm. and it I, I would say the most of the job falls into two buckets. One of them is to be essentially the eyes and ears of your principal when he or she's not able to be in the room because there's so much going on. Really trying to absorb what's going on and making sure you're aligned with the priorities of the person you work for and the company at large. And the second bucket is 
projects based on what you observe need to happen. Um, and I've worked on a lot of different projects at Oracle. The one that we're most excited right now is in understanding, telling, and making more cohesive the Oracle story as we move from just the database company to one that is um, doing so many wonderful things to help enterprises grow. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I got here. Yeah, that's, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I have been at Deloitte for quite some time and I've done a number of things, which is why I've, I've chosen to stay over the years. I started doing a lot of client account management and um, was actually privileged enough to be the women's initiative leader for Deloitte um, for about seven years, um, which is um, a position that reports into our CEO even today. So that, that was really fun and fascinating and very important for us. Um, I also ran um, what we call the customer market offering, which was basically helping frame how we serve the market of CMOs. I then was on the board of uh, Deloitte Consulting for about seven years. And then I had the opportunity to run the tech sector practice for us. So that's an industry vertical, um, so um, a, a revenue management role within the firm, which was an important part of my story as well. And um, last but not least, a year ago, I was asked to be the um, Deloitte Consulting Chief Marketing Officer in the US. So that's been fun. And while those things sound like they're very different, the one thing that I would say is that they're very, um, they were natural parts of my progression in the firm because of the personal brand I had. And um, I know you'll hear this when these women speak as well, but that's an important part of where you actually, people can see you go. And so, um, so for me, those were things like I was known within the firm, I am known within the firm about being a creative person, but being a pragmatic person so that, so I can imagine things that haven't been seen before, but I can also get them done. Um, there was a notion that I could solve problems that we didn't exactly know how to solve at any particular point in time. And then um, one thing that I think is a very female characteristic is I was also known for doing it with a lot of people by my side and for doing it for the good of the firm, not necessarily from a political or a personal perspective. So I'll, that's a little bit about how I got to some of those places that I wouldn't have necessarily said, oh, I'm gunning for this role, but people imagine me in those roles. Well, I have a very different story. <laughs> um, I went to the University of Texas in Austin. I got a couple of degrees because I was going to go to law school or medical school. But then I got married. Yeah. And one of us had to work. And we said, well, we're both trying to go to graduate school. And I said, well, whoever gets the job first <laughs> will work while the other one goes to graduate school, and then we'll swap. <laughs> How do you think that turned out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got a job in a tech firm and uh, worked in sales and marketing in that tech firm and kept taking bigger jobs and bigger jobs. Uh, it was a very male-dominated firm in the electronics industry in the early days of the computer industry in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so there were a lot of culture shifts in that area. I don't know that I noticed any of it. It just was what it was. And so you just one day kind of moved on. We did an IPO and then a secondary offering. Um, and then we did a public merger with another company out of California. And then we had culture shock because we had this self-grown entrepreneur-led uh, IPO company that went and joined up with a PE venture capital backed firm. And the culture shock was so intense that there really wasn't a great balance there. Um, and I thought there was a lot of passion for what we were doing in the market. I loved it. And so I negotiated with the board to buy the assets. Good thing I didn't know what I was doing at the time. <laughs> I didn't know any better. Um, and I started my firm. And that was almost 20 years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. That's Thank you. Thank you. As leaders, we face challenges and obstacles on a daily basis, a monthly basis, an annual basis. So Suzanne and Vanessa, if you can think through one of the biggest challenges you faced in your career, how did you make sure you continue to advocate for yourself? So Suzanne, if we could start with you. Yeah, sure. There's um, any number that I could choose from, but um, two quick ones. One was, um, you know, as I mentioned, I have had a lot of roles, but if you look in our environment, a couple of them, I stayed in those roles for probably a little bit longer than I should have. And the reason why that ended up happening was I was good enough at those roles that I was hard to replace. 
but I hadn't been explicit enough about kind of what my agenda was and re setting really deliberate goals so that I could say, look, when I hit these markers, then it's time for me to do the next thing. And so it became this thing where like, well, it was hard to replace, but you know, people, people liked the outcomes, but it wasn't also, I wasn't helping them to imagine me in a bigger role. So one of the things that I learned, which I would um, you know, encourage all of you to incorporate, is as you take new roles, be really clear about, okay, this is my remit, this is the outcomes I'm shooting for, and then as you make those outcomes, it allows you to then position and advocate for a bigger role or the next thing, right? Um, the second thing is I talked about I ran a part of the business, and that was an important thing for me because Again, I was kind of known as this creative uh, person that could solve problems people hadn't seen before. So people didn't naturally see me in kind of the traditional P&L type line roles. And as I went in there, I was clear in my own mind that there were things I wanted to do differently because that's why I thought I had gotten the job was that the people around me said she'll do it differently than it's been done before. And I think that was true, but what ended up happening was I ended up breaking some long-standing rules, which would have been fine, but what I didn't do was be explicit about the fact that I knew the rules were there and that I was going to break them. And the reason why I was going to break them was because of X, Y, and Z. And so what people assumed when I broke those rules and weren't explicit about why I was breaking them was that I either didn't understand the rules or I didn't respect the rules. Um, and so it ended up meaning that I had to kind of backtrack a little bit, play kind of a little bit more of the traditional role before then I had the buy-in to now start breaking some things and doing some different things very explicitly. Great, yeah. great, thank you. What would you add? Well, that's wonderful. Uh, it's a real story. I mean, it happens almost exactly the same thing in a different way for us as well. Um, but more on the outbound side with the customers mm -hmm. than inbound in the organization. Um, because it's I'm the chairman and CEO of our organization, um, I get to kind of do what I want mm -hmm. all the time. And so I didn't understand that there were specific roles of what I could do and couldn't do. Um, I knew that I could do whatever I wanted to and needed to to make the, the deal happen, make the, make the business move forward. But in our large customers, we have some large hotel customers that have lots of employees. They have lots of structure. They have lots of yeah. rules, especially there are spoken rules and there are unspoken, unspoken rules. And in our world, we just innovate. And failing fast is a wonderful thing that we celebrate all the time. So I had a really redefining moment when like my customer came to me, my largest customer, and said, just like what you said, you don't respect our rules. You're always breaking the rules. And I said, but it's just because I care and I want it to be better. I want you to do the same thing to me. So realizing yeah. exactly what yeah. you just said, you have to understand that there are rules and if you are going to break them, explicitly say, I am going to innovate and disrupt right now in this moment by doing this because I think that is the better outcome. Yeah. Um, and the biggest, you know, small story about that was uh, I had run this business for a long time and I didn't have any children. I got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a real opportunity killer sometimes. <laughs> 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 it could be, right? And so I went to my team and I went to my board and I said, um, I'd love to keep doing what I'm doing, but to do that, we're gonna have to change the rules and we're gonna have to make me al able to do this the way that I need to do it. And so we built a nursery and my daughter came to work every day. Nice. Then I had another one, and she came to work every day. <laughs> uh, they traveled with us all the time. They went to meetings with us. And um, the funnest story about that is we had a great meeting with Panasonic lined up for one of their big initiatives. And there were 12 guys from Japan that came to the room, came to the building. They were all lined up. Um, I had had a baby on Saturday night. <laughs> And I got a call from the office Monday morning and they said, what are you gonna do about the meeting with Panasonic? And I'm like, I have the VP of sales that's going to handle that. Call him. Well, he's not here. Tell him to get his lazy butt into the <laughs> office. He's in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He didn't come. And so I called the nanny who had just been working for me for three days and we loaded up and we came to the office and we had the meeting. But I had the baby in a pouch. Like she was this big, she was in a pouch. And all of the Japanese 
<laughs> in this particular meeting, agenda was very important, specifics of agenda, sitting at the table, there was a lot of structure, a lot of rules of this engagement. And I said, we have to change the agenda for the day. And, um, you know, I have a new boss, and if the boss says I have to take a break, we may have to take unplanned breaks to do what we need to do. <laughs> And there were a whole bunch of people I'd worked with at Panasonic before who knew this weird, crazy woman in Texas does this thing differently. <laughs> and there was this new young kid at the end of the table who was in charge, and you could see the, the older guys looking at each other going, wait for it, <laughs> wait for it, it's going to happen. And he, he got mad, and he said, I don't understand. I thought you were the boss. I only am going to meet with the boss. And I said, yes, I am the boss, but I have a new boss. And he said, I don't understand. And, and I took the pouch and I pulled it down. And there was a little baby's head. You would have thought I had thrown a snake under the <laughs> table. Like, <gasps> everybody. <gasps> and then he said, I still don't understand why you have to leave the room. I said, she's going to get hungry and I'm going to have to leave mm -hmm. to feed her. Someone else can do that. And I said, no. <laughs> I don't no, think so. <laughs> she is the baby. I am the food. Uh -huh. He bowed so fast and hit his head on the table so hard, <laughs> he had a red mark for the next two hours of the meeting. Um, so it's great to break the rules. It's great to make new rules, and that is, as women, what we have to do. Yeah, it's a great story. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mamie, in your introduction, you talked a lot about the diversity of your experience, which is really incredible. So in looking back at those experiences, how would you say they've really helped shape who you are today? So the first uh, college commencement speech I heard, and I was in the audience for, was the Steve Jobs one. Oh. Which, I mean, I think is basically like having Thomas Keller as your parents. You know, you just <laughs> expect every meal to be like that. But right. the, the following <laughs> commencement speeches I heard were not quite the same. But he talked about how you can't connect dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. And I feel like that's actually been, I can only look at it now, uh, because looking forward, I'm, you know, I'd be an astronaut. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's been super interesting thinking about how the diversity experience has been super helpful to me in my current job, and I imagine will be going forward. Um, when I interviewed with Larry, we had a really interesting conversation. And then when he gave me the job offer, he said, you know, I interviewed two other people who were MIT engineers. You were the riskiest choice, but the most interesting person. <laughs> and I was like, I think that was a backhanded compliment. <laughs> and I was like, I think that was a forehanded compliment. Um, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of things that I've done at work that I don't think I would have thought of or approached this way without the diversity of what I've done. Um, looking at some of those areas um, work to help put together the um, contract for the Ellison Institute for Transform Medicine, which is a cancer institute. That required pulling in my biology background as well as the legal background and negotiating people to say, here are the things that are the no-gos and here are the things that are gonna make the deal happen. Um, I think thinking about how we approach the next generation of storytelling, having an online advertising background really helps you think about how we approach the digital space and not just you know, in the traditional way. Um, and I don't think I would have necessarily picked the pivots if I'd known that they were going to be pivots. I mean, every decision was hard. Every decision is like, oh, well, is this the right move to make right now? But ultimately, I think it's okay to know that a lot of your decisions are they're, they're setting you up for the next thing that you're doing. You just don't know what it is yet. Great. That's Thank great. you. That's fabulous. Thank you. In our audience, we have a lot of individuals from companies and organizations of all different sizes. So Mamie and Vanessa, if you can think through past and current organizations you've worked with, how have they really strive to empower women in their careers? If we could start with you, Mamie. First? Oh, I went first last time. You want to go first this time? <laughs> Well, I haven't had a lot of organizational experience, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mine's very limited. Um, in our organization, what, well, I had a great team of mentors when I worked at my first company. Um, they were fabulous. They let me do anything that I wanted to do that I could prove that I could do. I learned if I went and asked permission to make some waves before I did it, that they backed me up. Yeah. And they supported me. Um, and so I was super lucky to have these guys that allowed me to do anything and everything that I said I could do. Um, I'm sure they were completely 
overwhelmed with my puppiness of just incredible enthusiasm all the time. I didn't understand that calendars uh, really took time to build. Um, and, and now we try to take that a different way. And so we bring in, well, we support, we go all the way back and support women's robotics teams, young girls in their robotics teams. We have um, internships with men and women coming out of technical backgrounds, and we bring them in, and we have a really good high, higher rate of bringing those people into the organization. And then instead of expecting millennials to have to go to a different job to get the next opportunity, my team is particularly understood and, and empowered to come to me or their team leader with what they want their next job to be to line out what they want that next opportunity to be. And if they think they can do it, we look at them and say, well, okay, we'll give it a shot. And, they're, and even if it's something that doesn't work out, they're not downgraded for, again, fail fast. Celebrate the opportunity and the willingness to fail fast. And teaching women to fail fast, I think is in some cases harder than teaching men to do that. But if you have an open environment where that's celebrated, um, that makes all the difference in the world where they are celebrated for trying. Uh, of course, they're celebrated more for doing and being successful, but it is success just thinking about things in a different way. So we use internships and just being able to allow people to take new jobs outside of their traditional role because they've come and said, hey, I would like to do more. Yeah, very empowering, thank you. Amy, would you add anything there? Yeah, I, I think I tend to think of this in terms of structured and unstructured programs. Um, I think structured programs, a lot of companies do have, including Oracle, Nick, uh, Nikki mentioned Oracle Women's Leadership, and I think there are different subsets under Oracle's Women's Leadership depending on region and uh, part time and career that um, allow women to uh, gain um, networks and as well as mentorship in that way. Um, and I think it's wonderful that um, companies are putting together more and more of these programs. But on the unstructured side, I think um, a, a lot of folks in the audience are, uh, you know, they're approaching this on, on an individual mindset. And so I, I tend to separate out what you as an individual can do. And I think of mentorship and allyship as, as the other subsection. Mentorship, everyone understands, but I think something to consider is that you know, your mentors don't have to look like you. I, I think most of my mentors don't look like me, and they um, have the kind of diversity of background that really helps me uh, find my blind spots, and they offer really great advice. And um, there's a concept of the personal board of directors where you have your different, essentially, directors or mentors, um, and they should be in different parts of the world and different sectors and industries so that they can kind of provide that full view that you may not be able to provide for yourself. Um, but something I've been thinking about a lot lately is the idea of allyship. Um, and yeah. I, I think of an ally as someone um, who will help you increase your voice or increase the opportunities for having a voice. Um, I, I love it when I'm in a meeting and, and someone notices that there's, a, there's someone junior or female in the room who's not speaking up, even though, though you know they have something to say, and who, who say, you know, Amanda, what do you think? And, and I think of the allyship as separate from mentorship because there's someone who's going to be pushing you and pulling you along in very just discrete instances. Sometimes you don't, may not know that your ally is in the room. In the same way, you should also be trying to be an ally, thinking about, I love the, uh, I, I loved what um, Deborah said about, you know, giving, uh, uh, when you take once, you give back three times, yeah, right? Awesome. Being an ally to those who are around you who may not have the opportunity to, to be heard. And so I think that's some of the things to consider on balance. Mm -hmm. I um, love that concept. I have one piece to add to that, I think. A lot of people, when they hear allyship and they hear us saying, you know, shoulder up, um, reach back twice, um, I think they're getting the wrong, some, some people get the wrong impression that you're giving preferential treatment to someone. I think what I hear you saying is you're giving an opportunity for accountability, you're giving coaching, you're, you're asking someone just to speak their mind and have their voice. Mm -hmm. Not that their voice is more important than anyone else, but just to point out to them and shine a light on them and say, what you have to say is important to me, I wanna hear it. And just encouraging them to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's so important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Suzanne, Deloitte has been at the forefront of this 
exact topic, especially in large corporations. And I know for you, it's been one of your key charters. So in looking at your 24 years at Deloitte, how have you seen the strategy evolve and how has it helped shape your own career path? Yes, no, I'm, I'm very proud of Deloitte in that space and I laugh because as we were preparing for this, I said, do we have to say that I've been with the firm 24 years? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it is an important part of the story. Um, we, we are proud that we, um, back in the early 90s actually, um, prior to my joining the firm, um, <laughs> did start down the path of, at the time it was Women's Initiative and, and then it went into a diversity um, um, uh, platform and I will tell you that the one thing that has remained constant that is really important on this topic is that is we have always believed that this was a business imperative it wasn't just something nice to do on the side that it was actually critical to our our success um, and that has only become more true over time if you think about um, uh, a lot of the things that the millennials and Gen Z people have brought to the table with respect to what is needed in the world that we see today um, has really brought to bear some of these things. So the biggest thing I think we've seen changing over time was when we first started down this path, it was a little bit more veered towards helping women be successful in a male paradigm world, right? And then over time, we started to say, well, what are the rules and the paradigms that we do as an organization that don't really fit both men and women and diverse and, um, and non-diverse individuals, right? So how do we change kind of the organization? And now where we're, we're really working very hard is what we call inclusion. And it's this notion of every one of us has dimensions that are visible and invisible that make us very different. Uh, it could be, um, you know, the, the age and what you want today is going to be different than what you want in five years mm -hmm. and it will be different than what you wanted, you know, 10 years ago. And so it's this notion of how do you create an environment that's supportive of inclusion regardless of the differences um, between all of us. And so I think that's been pretty f profound. And we've done a lot of things around um, thinking through what is an inclusive leader and I will tell you, for the women in the room, the nice thing about that is, again, if you think about a world in which problems have really, problem solving has changed pretty markedly, right? This notion of you don't go alone, there are a lot of companies that are coming together to solve problems. The functional disciplines have broken down pretty significantly based on a lot of the tech trends and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a world where we need to bring more people together. And a lot of what have been sort of historically considered female characteristics of leadership are in very high demand. Things like empathy and collaboration and creativity and, um, and this networking and all of those kinds of things that we all do very naturally are very, very high demand. And then, you know, the one thing I will just say to kind of riff a little bit on, on what you said was, if you don't have someone, this whole, n you know, I love the, the ally, um, uh, we, we call it sponsorship, right? And one of the things that we found in our research is the one thing that women don't get enough of um, and, and get less of compared to men are people that they believe have their, um, have their back and have unconditional love for them. And because of that, they're willing to tell them hard truths. Um, so a lot of women get sort of like, yeah, you're doing fine, go get them, you did this thing great, but they don't have as not much, and you know, if you think about your friendships, right, your friends are the ones that will tell you, hey, Suze, you got half of your, le your salad in your teeth, right? <laughs> you know, they're the ones that are kind of, and you, and you hear that from them in a way that's very different than people that you think are kind of criticizing you or whatever. So find people in your network, find people in your circle that you think will tell you hard truths and do that for other people as well because it's really hard to do. Yeah. So important, yeah. Absolutely, the hard truth is sometimes the hardest to hear but the most valuable right. and really helps you grow, so that's great. In, in wrapping up the panel, one of the best things about coming and listening to this is getting a piece of specific advice or feedback that you can take with you back home, back to your office. So Mamie and Suzanne, what would be the key piece of advice you would give? Um, you know, I'm gonna share a, a couple of um, hard truths from mentors okay. of mine, um, quotes from them. The first was, um, you know, when you're building the team, pick people who have different skills than you. You don't want a team of people just like you. I mean, I don't think we'd all wanna be working with people just like us, but sometimes you forget in the hiring process because it's so much easier to communicate uh, 
uh, connect with people just like you. Um, the second thing was, um, you know, I was talking to a mentor about a task I had to do, and he was like, I was like, I don't think I know how to do it. I don't know why they're telling me to do this. I don't know what I'm doing. And he's like, well, it doesn't matter if you know how you do it or not, because they're going to make you do it anyway. So you might as well get the credit for it. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, yeah, you know, that's, that's always a hard ask. I mean, we've heard it so many times. Women don't think to ask. They're afraid to ask. And he was basically pushing me and saying, you're going to do it anyway. You know that. So get the ask. And the third, the third thing is actually more of a life anecdote than a work anecdote. But um, uh, one of my favorite people, well, Okay, that's not fair. But he's amazing as the Oracle stunt pilot, Sean Tucker. And, and I was flying with Sean a couple of years ago. And he's like, oh, have you gone skiing lately? And I'm like, well, no, I've been really busy. And he was like, you know, it takes a lot of work to stay interesting. And I was like, I just oh, got schooled nice. by a guy who's like twice my age, you know? <laughs> but I think his point was like, you can't be complacent. Like, this is right. your life. You have right. to keep trying. You have to keep pushing. It's not going to get easy. No one's going to hand it to you. And so sometimes when I'm like, oh, I'm so tired, I'm like, what would Sean say? <laughs> got it. I love that. Um, okay, great. So what I always tell people are um, three things with a little add-on. The first one is be proud. Um, yes. You are going to get a lot of the negative um, feedback and people will make sure they point out things that you aren't doing right at exactly that moment. But be take the time to be proud of who you are, what got you to the place that you are, and who got you there, right? And be really centered on that and take time to relish in that. Um, the second thing I always say is um, be bold, right? And this is this notion of people want you involved because it will be different as a result of you being involved. So really push those edges, right? If they wanted it to be done by the way it used to be done, they wouldn't have asked you to do it. So really be try, try to break out of your norms, surround yourself with people that are different with you so you can actually really push the boundaries of being bold. Um, and the last thing I always say is be better. And nobody wakes up in the morning and says, geez, I, I really hope I get stuck in a rut today. <laughs> but the way it happens is really insidious because if you go through more than a couple of days in a row, in a, in a row where you're not scared or nervous or not sure that you can do what's in front of you, you're not being better on an ongoing basis. So really put yourself out there. Um, on an ongoing basis. And, and then the, the last thing I always say is we spend an inordinate amount of time um, at work. Work used to be something we did and now it's kind of part of who we are. So find an environment where you laugh hard and laugh often. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's great. great. Vanessa, you made a shift in your career in turning towards being an entrepreneur. So for those female entrepreneurs in the audience, what piece of advice would you give them? Make sure that it's the passion that you have that you cannot live without. Because it is a hard road and it is a real road. So make sure that it is something that you have to do. If you feel in your heart of heart that you have to do this, then, then go for it. Listen to yourself. Uh, look yourself in the mirror every day. Look your 12-year-old self in the mirror every morning. I'm going to steal something from that I heard last week. Look your 12-year-old self in the mirror every morning and say, wow. I look pretty great today. Yeah. I have this great red jacket. I get to go to this great job. Be proud. Be, pr be Great shoes, fun <laughs> shoes, right? The fact that I actually can wear comfortable shoes because I get to be the cool tech CEO. Be proud <laughs> of those things. Own it. Um, I spent a lot of time worrying that someone would realize that I didn't know what I was doing in my job. Someone's going to figure it out. But know that you actually do know what you're doing in your job. But you surround yourself with great people, and it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful. And with that, we certainly have time for some audience questions. We'd love to hear from all of you if there's anything you would like to know. Yes, please. Uh, so this is kind of a general one for all of the panel. What would you say over the course of your career was your biggest failure? And then what did you do to overcome on the other side? And that's everyone. I'll take biggest failure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my biggest failure was um, not understanding when I was breaking the rules. So kind of being uh, 
what I thought, what we call it now at our office, we have a word for it, we call it a misapplied strength. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a strength of being strong and bold and innovative, but if you misapply that strength, um, and the number one thing that I did to fix it was I acknowledged it and I apologized. So I was courageous enough to be vulnerable and say, yeah, I see that I did that, um, and I apologize. I apologize often at work. There's someone here that'll, that'll attest to that. <laughs> I do. For me, I would say not trusting my gut instinct. I'm very much a gut instinct. Sure. I know what I want. I go get it. And, you know, there's a, a specific time that I didn't trust it, and I made a really poor decision, and that decision followed me around for a good nine to ten months. But... You know, despite that failure, I think I really grew in my career, and it challenged me in ways that I didn't think I had the capacity to handle. So even though looking back, I'm like, gosh, Jenny, I really shouldn't have done that. Um, I think for me, it, it really has helped me understand how to overcome those types of situations. Yeah, um, I talked a little bit about a couple of them, but... Um I, um, I, I think the one of the ones that haunts me the most is there was a period of time in my career where I, um, I felt like I was, in, in hindsight, I sort of gave away some of my power. And I was letting things happen to me more than I was making them happen. And that's one thing, you know, that's about me and, and I needed to kind of shift that and I ultimately did. But there were some people that were close to me during that time that watched me do that, and they ended up making choices as a result of it that weren't their best choices. And so that's one thing is that, you know, sometimes if you are getting down or if you're, you know, saying, like, these things are happening to me, do it for yourself to kind of change up the mode and the energy because people want you to do that. But also do it for the people around you, right? Because um, a lot of people are watching and they want you to do well. And so just enlist that, right? And harness that energy because, um, because there are people watching and we need to kind of lead the way with each other. So, you know, hook arms with some people and, and help each other out. If you're down, pull them up. Um, you know, and they'll do the same thing when you when you need it. So, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to rephrase your question uh, or answer a different question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the, the 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 thing that I've thought about whether I do again is is law oh, school, um, uh, and uh, I, I think there's the part of. Uh, being an immigrant where you think that you have to do the thing to get to the place because of all the sacrifices that happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I'm, I, I don't think it was the wrong decision, but I'm not sure I would do it again um, because I, I learned so much in the process and I grew to be who I am today. But at the same time, th there's an opportunity cost there. And, and I think sometimes when you're, when you're trying to, to, to do it for survival, to do as much as you can, you kind of forget about, well, in the long term, is this the right decision, right? Um, so, yeah. You know, the one thing I would add maybe that I've gotten better at over the years is, um, you know, the I wish I would have kill you, right? Yes. Um, and that mindset will kill you. Um, so what I have done over the years is sort of said, like I get, you know, I call them small, medium, and large, and, and I have a set amount of time that I can kind of dwell on a mistake I think I made, right? So like a little one's two hours. Um, and in that time frame, I want to think about what that, that did, but I want to focus on two things. Can I fix it, right? So can I make it better? And if I can't, what can I learn from it? And then after that set period of time, I kind of say like, Okay, that's the utility of it. I can't, I can't do anything more, so I've got to move forward. Um, and I highly encourage that because, particularly as women, we spend a lot of time like, oh, I got to um, And I even do that with my ten-year-old son. It's like, you know, yes, I know you feel bad about this. Can we fix it? Um, if we can't, what do we learn that we won't do again? Okay, great. Let's move on. Thank you. Great question. Yes, I, um, so go ahead, sorry.
in business that we can say, I want to be like her, or as the woman who opens today, I want to be golfing with her or doing some something that causes me to be on that inside circle and not to actually reflect on what I'm doing wrong, but to focus on what else I can do to be all that I feel that I was born to be and use the variety pack of skill sets that I have and personality attributes and all the elements that I can use as a woman to become something quite relevant in the categories that I want to shine in. And I'd love to, to learn a little bit more about what you have had as women inspirations who are in business and at the top of their game. And most particularly, maybe the audience is not aware, but you can speak to it about uh, Sasha Katz, who's one of the most powerful women CEOs, co-CEO of Oracle, mm -hmm. who really made it happen. She's one of my inspirations. And um, I'd love to hear other women who have influenced you. And if I can tag onto it, one of the problems that we women have is access to make your emails, all of our emails, open to others. Give a few minutes to someone who says, I don't know how to do it. And if I know how to do something, I know I pick up the phone or I send an email and I make that connection using my personal capital to give it away so that another woman can have access to women leaders. And that's, uh, that's proof on the ground when a woman becomes successful in business. Advice notwithstanding, it's results. And we'd all like to learn a lot more about how to be results driven so that we can be self-actualizing. Thank you. So who has inspired us? I can start. Um, the first person I would say is, is my mom. Yeah. And I know, she's so amazing. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny, actually. I was telling one of the marketing gals about this. She emailed today because she knew I was coming up here. And she's like the epitome of your Bostonian Jewish mother that has a ton of energy and is hilarious. And she was comparing me to Barbara Walters. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a great comparison. Um, thank you. But, you know, one of the things that she really instilled in me was, was work ethic and being responsible and accountable for yourself. And it stuck with me in my entire short career, but the only person that I can always count on and depend on is myself, and I will get myself to that next level. I will get myself that next opportunity. I will get myself a seat at this table, and you know, since I was little, that's always really just stuck with me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about um, working with Safra. Um, she is, um, she's really quite remarkable. She's very much a force of nature. Uh, in, in the way that she is, she's such a hard worker. Um, I, I think that uh, she always likes to, to tell the story about how um, when she grew up and she was studying computer science, she was the only female in the room and she didn't, she didn't really think about that. She was uh, just trying to work as hard as she could to do as much as she can. And so I think it, it's, it's very remarkable that, um, that Actually, and this is a viewpoint that I think is very helpful. You know, when you go into a room that is mostly male, you don't actually notice it. And maybe it's because it's a frequent enough occurrence that you're like, I'm just here to do my job. I feel like that's a viewpoint that um, while, while we should always be empathetic and, and be role models for, for other women, I think it's also important to just think about, you know, we're just here to do our jobs. And hopefully these people we're working with I treat them as equals. I, it doesn't matter who they are, and it, it doesn't matter who I am because we're all just here to do our jobs. And I think that's very much Safra's approach, and she really commands this sort of presence in a room in that way, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, the one thing I would say, which is a little twist on your um, your question, is what I always encourage women to do because. Females in particular can be relatively ruthless about who they define as a role model. And in today's nuanced world, what I would say is have, you know, pick from maybe five people that you like an aspect of each one of them. And then the way you bundle it is uniquely yours, right? Because it's a lot of pressure to put on some of our female leaders to be 
the be all end all in all dimensions, right? And we do, we should be pulling on all different kinds of people, whether it's, you know, gender, diversity, experiences, um, you know, backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the one thing that I would say, and I've done that a lot where I've, you know, sort of said, I wanna be uh, a mother like this individual, and I wanna be, um, you know, a market maker like that individual. And, and I was really lucky and, you know, we, we have, multiple female CEOs, and so there were there were a lot of people to pick from, but if you're in an organization where there aren't a lot of female leaders, I always say find the male leader that has daughters, right? Because, so there's lots of places that you can go to get inspiration and real, um, you know, advice. Find leaders who care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leaders who care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say my family, for sure. Uh, my mom worked really hard, she worked three jobs. My grandmother was a vice president of a bank in Panama. Wow. You didn't get to be a vice president of a bank as a woman in Panama. Yeah. Um, both of my grandmothers uh, dressed up as boys to be on the sports teams in their respective um, worlds, which is kind of a funny thing. Yeah. They never saw something that they couldn't do, and they were very clear with me that I could do anything that I wanted to do. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you so much to the audience for those wonderful questions, and thank you. Mamie, Suzanne, and Vanessa for that incredible insight. Um, it was great having you all here. So with that, enjoy the rest of Sweet World. We have two women's sessions tomorrow, so we hope you can attend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Thank you. So I think we... Um, I was really interested to hear some very common themes amongst all of those um, different sections. So, you know, we heard that it's, it's okay to fail, but fail quickly. It's, it's good to ask for help, but make sure that you give it back. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I heard a common theme along, along all of those different conversations about work ethic and working hard and be different. It's okay to break the rules, but keep it in context. So hopefully you've uh, learned something today, or maybe you've just enjoyed um, what you've heard in the different conversations you've heard. But again, I'd like to say thank you to Deborah, to Mamie, to Vanessa, to Suzanne and to Jenny. And thank you all to come, for coming this afternoon and do enjoy the rest of the uh, breakout sessions that we have tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.